Hello, welcome to episode 205. Uh, this is Brennan Ferguson, designer. Uh, this is Chuck Jordan, designer. It's Heather Logus, designer. Dave Bogan, art director. And Dave Grossman, superfluous appendage. <laughs> <laughs> My sixth finger. Spaceship will self-destruct in three... So this is the first time we did a straight up, absolute, no doubt about it, these two episodes are linked together. Episode three to four had a, a pretty much a cliffhanger ending, but this one was they jump in a portal and jump out of it the next time. You okay, Max? And this is the episode where we basically said we don't care, or not that we don't care, but uh, people, <laughs> people pretty much have to know what's going on by this point. This is not the one that you start watching the season from. We did have one play tester who had never played any Sam Max episode. She was able to make it, make it through, um, but it was definitely not ideal. <laughs> but that was something we definitely tried to do for the first season was we made a real effort to make all the episodes self-contained and playable yeah, in and absolutely. of themselves. And, and, and again, this season, I mean, we, we do always ask the play testers who haven't played it, could you follow along, which is something you couldn't understand. And this one's still fun on its own. It just makes a lot more sense if you've yeah, played at least no. the one previous. Just to, to start a game and a dead guy falls through a portal with you is kind of strange. <laughs> it's kind of so we had known all along that uh, you know, the, the doorway to hell would basically be right under their street. Um, and so I, I believe the manhole originally was on the other side near where Sybils used to be in season one, but we had to move it because right. the whole idea was always that they'd walk out and say, oh, here we are back at our street. Hopefully it feels like a nice homecoming. How do we end up on our own street? You mean we've been living over the gateway to hell all this time and never took advantage of it? Our condo association is going to be receiving a very stern letter about this. We talked about the times of day for the various things, hey, buddy, and at some point we just kind of seemingly haphazardly said, I don't know, how about the last episode will be the episode where we finally make it at night. Um, Thanks, but it, it does end up making it feel a lot different well, at least. Well, Jimmy Two Teeth, we haven't seen much of you lately. Yeah. Yeah, especially when we get to stuff like you're talking to a baby rat at the end of the street that yeah, it was, is next to a robot. We didn't realize it would be at night. Yeah, it's it's completely invisible. We had to make it on a wheel of cheese so that you could see little <laughs> tiny Timmy. I forget, but that, that scene with the egg right there. Hmm? And was it that last time we saw that scene with the egg in the other episode? Was it night then? Too? Yeah, it was. Yeah. We did make it out night outside. And so at the beginning of episode four, when you come crashing in through Bosco's, Brian had to go back and make it nighttime outside there and nighttime outside the window. Man, we rock. <laughs> we can paint things black. I would say that 99% of the continuity for the season is dead on. Somebody thought of it. Maybe 95%. Ever since he drank that drain cleaner, what we need is a computer. What's there? Right, so this robot, um, I really liked his character. Um, Jeff Lester had the idea to have this robot who would quote song lyrics, and I really thought that was a great idea, and I, I kind of didn't want him to die. Um, and so I, I thought about, we thought about the idea in episode one of having him still be alive, just unable to move, um, and he would just talk about the critters inside of him, you know, eating him away or whatever. Um, but then we already had enough characters to write, and it, it, seemed, it seemed pretty cool to be able to wake him back up again later. And we always want to control giant robots. That's that's pretty much everybody's dream. I did want to say there was a line in I Will Survive that would have been appropriate, but we cut for time. That was the, uh, if, if I'd have known that you'd come back, I would have made you leave your key, because you start out taking the key from his back. That would have been. There will be snow flurries in hell before I let you have control of a two-story tall battle robot, Max. This one I remember being difficult because we don't have a lot of, you know, um, complex turn animations at our disposal, especially for characters who are rarely used, like the robot. Um, and so um, we had to hide his feet. We had to make the camera so that you couldn't see him pivot and stuff like that. I remember being difficult for not knowing any rat-related uh, rock songs. <laughs> yeah. I just did a search for rat and just put first song I found, which was by the White Stripes. So I thought, well, cool people will know this. 
Uh, but apparently, no cool people work here because nobody. <laughs> I've never met anybody that's heard of it. <laughs> I've got the album that's on, and I. <laughs> And so this name, the Soul Train, that was one of the very first things we thought of for the season. Brendan was really, really into the Soul Train. <laughs> Actually, that Steve, Steve's idea for a long time was to have this, and that the season pretty much ended up being in hell and having this train because Steve, that, that was one of his ideas for a long time. So we kind of worked this whole thing to end up there. And like so many things. But you were just really big on the name, the Soul Train. Yeah, I definitely wanted to have that, that whole talk in the, the Soul Train thing. And Chuck wrote some great lines for there. So again, that Roger Jackson did all every, basically any time somebody speaks with a really deep voice, it's Roger L. Jackson. And uh, any time in the games, I should point out, not in real life. But <laughs> yeah, my voice actually right now is being done by Roger L. Jackson. <laughs> But it's just amazing how he just gets different little nuances in between the different versions, like the karaoke voice versus the modified soda popper's voice that we'll see later on. All right. At some point, we did want to have a scene inside the Soul Train. Yeah, I do remember that. You were, it was going to be kind of yeah. Last Express. Yeah, like, last, I love Last Express. You're going to talk to people and stuff like that in there. Yeah. Um, just too much. It's we, just, yeah. We had too much stuff going on. It was, it was also we a little bit like Final too. Fantasy VII, where they had their little train ride. Yeah, again. Final Fantasy VII. But we always so have... Disappointed we didn't get to see what's on the way to hell. Way too much. Uh, too many ideas for any yeah. one. We ended up with too many. That would have been ten too many. Who authorized this? A giant horned skull? Really? I'm sorry. That's Grant's joke. Oh, very well. Grant, our concept artist. Grant Alexander. That was a good one. In my office. I love the, uh, the, voice, the voice of Satan. Uh, I know he came out with it like a Gary Cole office space. We had everybody do auditions from that front. But I forget exactly how the James Mason idea came up. I just remember that as soon as, I think you mentioned it, Brendan. Yeah, we're, 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 that's another one of those running things where we always say, and then this person has the voice of James Mason. And then for some reason we just say, okay, for Satan, it really will be the voice of James Mason. <laughs> James Mason, who's from like, he's like the villain from North by Northwest. And it was strictly based on Brendan's version of the, uh, <laughs> we seem to be in a bit of a pickle. <laughs> So this was another thing where we had so many ideas for what hell could have been like. Yeah. But uh, this definitely was a good yeah, went, direction. When we went with this whole corporate idea, it was it was fun actually that we could, could bring back the shambling corporate presence. That's an odd way to tie the two seasons together. Yeah. Who and it, it was under your street the whole time, just as right. later yeah, turns out to be. That was in the text adventure. Right. I think originally uh, Hell was going to be middle school in, in, in one of the yeah, we, we I pushed a lot really of strong for Hell would be middle school. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been a good way to do it. But I think it turned out pretty good. nice. They opened it already, but I had a speech prepared and everything. Right, so, I mean, the, the supposed plot, although I'm, I think it's pretty much been lost by this point, was that the Mariachis were crushing the souls and packaging them in some way so that they could be efficiently stored in hell. Of course, it ends up being seemingly infinite space, so I'm not sure what the trouble is. But the, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I always like the, these kind of miniature rooms. Um, let's just say I have a fascination with dollhouses. Um, and so I, I thought it was really interesting to be able to go into these little miniature rooms rooms and see all the tiny people in there. Do you have any chainsaw gasoline? We ended up not being able to do as much as I was hoping of where you would look out and see giant things. You do see Max when you go to your own personal hell, but we had talked about at some point that you would have some sort of conversation with Bosco and he'd be like, oh my gosh, they're really watching me now because there's giant versions of you out there. This was also really fun um, brainstorming about all Looks like Sam and Max the different characters' personal hells. Right. We had, a, we had a lot of possibilities. <laughs> I didn't realize until these, <laughs> until these uh, recaps just how many late 70s references I'm trying to scram into these games. Yeah, there, there's a lot. It's appropriate. I'm not being watched. I'm free! 
quick Bosco, let's vamoose or skedaddle, whichever's faster. Vamoose! Yeah, that particular puzzle I remember being hard. Um, I was really hoping that we'd be able to design it so that you realized at some point that physically these dioramas are actually separated by a pretty small space. So we kept trying to design a puzzle in which you would physically in the real world find a way to get to another diorama, but it ended up just being too hard to figure out how to do that, so we pretty much just gave you all the tools to, to do that so that you would just end up doing that, I think. Most people solve that one by accident, but I hope it's still still fun and satisfying at the end. Hey, Lucifer, we want to talk to you. So this is something I was really looking forward to all along, that the characters from season one that had died would, would come back, so we'd at least have a little cameo for each one. We had a discussion about whether Brady Culture had actually died or not. Santa's workshop. Uh, yeah, that one ended up being a bit of a continuity problem, as I recall. Uh, I, I had forgotten, I think, on the on the newspaper stand in episode two that we had said that he was in jail. Um, he died in jail. Yeah, so he succumbed to his injuries. That's the way I, that's the way I rationalized, it, rationalized it with myself. He was released from jail and then beaten by the soda bottles. <laughs> Run over by a truck. I remember that one. He, he really wet himself. Certainly the fans had been clamoring for the return of Brady culture. <laughs> yeah, everybody was, was asking for that. I love recalling toys. Boopy! The problem is these babies make it impossible to concentrate. What's the matter with uh, the This is Chris? somewhere around here, some more of my great voice work. I did one of the babies, I forget. <laughs> which which lines I did. I, li I really like the way Santa's design ended up, actually. Uh, we didn't really mention it in the episode one commentary, but <clears throat> Steve sent back this crazy... I don't even know. It was like bomb shelter version of Santa. Like right, right. Like crazed and right. He really hit that that still idea. Still in his there. pajamas, but with a you know a survival vest on. And right. That whole survival angle I thought was a good one. Just some guy who's lived alone for all this time out in the middle of the wilderness. And the shaved head. Yeah, that helped a lot. Looks like some kind of. Like playing up the creepy recluse angle. So yeah, here's here's another one where we had talked about. You're going to meet all the characters who have died across throughout the season, and you would see their personal hells. And the idea we, we started with was that you'd see theirs kind of from the outside in some way, and then you would experience your own personal hell. Um, but then it, it really just seemed like it would be best if they each could have kind of their own space to have a hell. They weren't just kind of standing around in a room or something. Um, and so I, I asked if we could possibly go back to all kind of the sets that were appropriate to them. In this case, just kind of bring back the Mafia Toy Factory for no good reason, but I mean, it is an elf, and Toy Factory seems appropriate. But uh, it's another one of those ones where it seems like we're going to be able to reuse a lot, but it ends up still being a lot of work. I believe that's Julian doing that voice, Julian, our voice director. Yeah, that one was a little hard to set up. I think you're expecting to have Santa even drive home even more that the kids were annoying him and the elf to drive home more that the, he, he liked the kids. Right, so it's supposed to be this kind of, uh, the, the, their hells are the reverse of one another that you see. Oh, if only these two guys' worlds could merge. And again, it, it actually began with this idea that their two environments are actually connected. One goes right to the next one, so if you could get these babies to fall through the floor. Um, but then it ended up being, it just seemed like going through the gift tube was the easiest way to connect those two environments. Mr. Bliss, huh? Are you Bliss? <laughs> yes, I know. It took a great risk hiring a sentient bacteria to work for us. But the right, so here's one. There, I mean, there are people um, who will occasionally say they hate Hugh Bliss, his voice, and everything about him, everything he stands for. Um, They're just <laughs> wrong. Nevertheless, they are so I just, thought, I, it just, I really like the idea that he would have a cameo, but um, it was always intended. Like he's not going to talk too long. He's not going to talk long enough that you really hate him. And then I think we were, we were going back a little bit on on how much he should say, but then. And even I was having some trouble listening to the dialogue for Hugh Bliss. <laughs> and I, I, I like this idea that he would be kind of giving you the silent treatment. So we pretty much went through about five exchanges and just removed Hugh Bliss's line. 
I mean, it ended up seem, pre seeming pretty funny that he just silently stares at you every time. Did you get that meeting request I sent? What are your dreams? Hey, I'm sorry about killing you last year. It happens. What do you do here? I work for the largest division of hell. The so this whole puzzle sequence was one of the ones that I was most fond of. The central idea, it ended up getting kind of convoluted, <laughs> uh, which was I really wanted to have somebody get sent to hell. That just seems like something that Sam Max would do. Like I just need to solve some puzzle, so I'm gonna have to get somebody in there. And so we came up with this idea that if we could get Tiny Timmy sent to hell, because he was always kind of slated to die anyway, so we had to have some way. First of all, we had to think of why would it help you at all to get Timmy sent to hell? Who knows? Um, and so we thought, well, what if his swearing causes a problem? So it seemed appropriate that the FCC would be a division of hell. Um, and then we had to think of, okay, now how are we going to get him? How are we going to get Tiny Timmy sent to hell? Um, and we went through, through lots of things that I remember. This is one, another one of our running jokes was that I said, well, on the show Dexter, they framed some guy by sticking a heroin needle in his arm. And so we were joking that would be the thing. And so that just kept coming up that in various ways, you would be sticking heroin needles in people's arms. That seemed a little bit much. Um, but then we ended up with this, the, the classic image of the person's file. It seemed, it seemed apropos to the whole corporate environment to have these files. Um, hey, someone opened the two teeth drawer. So wow, a lot of times we're looking for things where um, <coughs> it's like you as a player kind of immediately get the idea where we don't have to talk too long about it. You're like, all right, a person's file. So somebody's got a thick file. He's been a bad person. He's going to go to hell. You ain't that much time left. He's starting to hallucinate. And the Tourette's is getting worse. People are always making fun of me because I'm, I'm constantly suggesting uh, puzzles where the solution involves paperwork. And so, <laughs> right. so or other, this is yet another word of that. Right, well, we're always... In hell, it seems particularly... Yeah, it did, it did seem very appropriate for there. Um, what we're always doing is we're trying to find the right amount of balance when we're designing a puzzle where it feels crazy and off the wall and silly, and yet you can figure it out. Um, and so we're, we're usually looking for a puzzle where there's no clear way to solve it, but you could do something roundabout. And so Dave will typically say, what if I file an insurance claim in order to get this thing to happen? <laughs> and then that, that seems about the least fun thing I can think of to do, but it is definitely roundabout. Don't judge me for this, Max. It's for his own good. Bless you. It seemed like the kill, shooting the monster upset people more than we expected. Just because he's, we've just always thought of him as a uh, All right, disposable character. I mean, he's he's pretty much the dead from the start. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's just the living dead, basically. I mean, we did that. The whole puzzle was we said, okay, we need to distract death, so you got to kill somebody to do that. And we said, oh, perfect. We'll just have the monster right there. Um, and nobody cares if you kill him. He's he's already dead. It's important for the setup for him to want to die. Yeah, but we we did go ahead and make sure that he says. Thank you. Please kill me. Oh, I'm so happy that you killed me. <laughs> ah, finally, a simple, straightforward death. Yeah, I don't know if that read like we'd originally. Yeah, the the joke was supposed to be that it's the same beep from the machine as the beep that cuss uh, that you know bleep out his cuss word. So it's like <laughs> beep 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 beep. Kid must have really been busy on his deathbed. You should have seen it. It was like every single letter ever written to Hot Bunny combined into one debaucherous rampage. Oh, well. Hot Bunny is a magazine now. where Maxine Le Pew was from. Right. Hi, you, Timmy. Is your soul and there was going to be a copy of it in the bathroom at Bosco's for you to look at, emulate. <laughs> we somehow managed to bring every single television show set back. I'm not, there seems to be a little bit high on the TV sets, but. <laughs> well, just I think the first thing I think of whenever I think of hell is the uh, Emerald Live show. <laughs> so I wanted a version of that. I simply cannot allow this. We don't have that. Who, who's never going to be a millionaire set on here? Dude. No, we don't have that at Myra, but. Well, that was exciting. Nick did a lot of work to get all those rats to pop away. Is this Stinky's freak out moment? Oh yeah, it is. This animation was really weird. 
I've been so happy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably never ever see him happy again. The scariest <laughs> thing is Stinky being happy. <laughs> we broke out. <laughs> I was under the impression you were here to increase productivity. And yet our efficiency is at an all time. Now the, the the demons blarg, that's really the way that we always talk about it. Yeah. We say and then he says this, blarg, blarg, blarg. Blarg, blarg. We haven't been properly introduced. We're Sam and Max. Now from the statue. Pleased to meet you. I hope you've guessed mine. Yeah, and you better release our pal Souls from Hell. There's no excitable <laughs> little friend is getting angry. And I'm angry too. There's no need for that kind of talk. I'll gladly release your friend. That's Just sign why the uh, title is what it is. <laughs> that line. And that's that. Well, <laughs> gee, Sadie. Thanks. Now, just do me a favor. You're overdoing the, the uh, horrible thing you can imagine. Overdoing the hell and devil wait, references wait, there a little bit. No, <laughs> wait. Okay. Good. Now, off you go. Well, at one point, I kind of went back through the game um, and, and was looking for kind of missing lines or things. Oh, yeah, what if you use a coffee on the coffee pot? Those kind of lines. Um, and so I was just listening to every single look at line, and I was definitely getting that feeling of, wow, we talk about hell a lot in this episode. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, this is another one of those ones where this, is, this episode has seemingly always had this idea that Sam would enter his own personal hell we talked about that maybe even being the whole kind of second half of the game. Um, but then this idea of Sam and Peepers just seemed too good. We just had to go with that, but we couldn't actually leave you in a room with Peepers the whole game. So, Am I remembering wrong that um, the Sam and Peepers was in, one of, in 204 at some point where you go back and change history and you ruin it so that it ends up that Peepers had been your partner the whole time? Um, I don't recall that. Yeah. I can't remember which way it was. I remember there was a cut there. We, we went back and forth on whether or not to include Sam and Peepers in the episode at all, especially right before the big reveal that we're about to see. Yeah, I did. I, I admit I felt some concerns about that. So it was not something that surprised us, but at the end it was just the, the potential for having Sam and Peepers was too good to pass up. Inescapable. Sorry, Satan. We were receiving pressures no match for from people. It has to be Sam and Peepers. Plus I ripped out his kidneys. Well, this does put me into a bit of a pickle. <laughs> Management will have my head about this. That's, that's his character defining line for some reason. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very well delivered line. Oh. Well, we went really back and forth on Satan and what his character was going to be like. Because one way of doing it was to make him a really just a sad sack. But I, I kind of thought the, the way this story is that Satan is Satan. He's that scary guy that we all know. Um, but then he becomes corporatized as to see the, a really fearsome guy in this. And it ended up being kind of a in between, I guess. I'm really glad we didn't go with the uh, Office Space Gary Cole version. Just as funny as that would have been, it was a little bit too predictable. I love the idea that Satan's voice is so in completely incongruous with his appearance. <laughs> could be worse than former child stars. But that was before we beat Brady culture to death and realized we were for much greater evil. Maybe he never made it to jail after all. Maybe that story... Maybe that story was just a... Uh, it was planted by the popper. Yeah. <laughs> it's planted. design movement. A civil war. Each step made us more hated and more powerful. <laughs> what did we ever do to you? Wasn't jail in quotes on the paper? <laughs> we put everything in quotes. You sent him to jail, by which later. we mean he's dead. And these glasses aren't cheap. Oh, there it is. And worst of all, the mariachis never came to sing for us. Wow. It was actually really just fortuitous that their whole, their birthday thing kind of all linked up with the mariachis. That when we were coming up with the whole mariachi celebrating people's birthday was not for that reason. And then it just ended up, oh yeah, you went to them on their birthday, so 
That would be a perfect reason for them to No, no, it. we were planning ahead <laughs> when we were making the yeah. second episode. I mean, we, we were planned it by the we time we were designed it, so five. And <laughs> we were already planning this. I just mean, when we were thinking of mariachis, the fact that they celebrate birthdays was not because of soda five instead of No, all thought of in advance. <laughs> I think it's funny how we kind of developed the scheme of what the whole season was about and what was going on, and um, I don't think I would have expected that it would it would take so much uh, explanation. <laughs> I think by the time you you know you've designed several episodes, you just kind of you take for granted that this yeah. is the scheme and this is what's happening. But then when you finally come time to convey it to the player, yeah. Like, well, oh, Chuck on geez. these ones was always a voice of reason because. We do tend to, when we're writing the designs, we just, and then this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and yeah, of course. What else? And Mario, she's coming, say happy birthday, etc. And Chuck says, you know, it's really not obvious to people that these time-traveling mariachis are, you know, here for this reason, and so. This scene does have a lot of explanation all at once, but honestly, when I played through this episode for the first time, this was, to me, one of the funniest scenes. I really loved it when they said, and then we'd be pretty culture to death. <laughs> Even though that's quite grim, and I would not normally like that sort of thing. It was really funny in that situation, too. I'm a big sucker for exposition, so I love these scenes. I wanted to go for on for even longer. I know somebody one of the playtests said they wanted this scene to go on longer. I was like, "What? Are you crazy?" Actually, that, that was you that said that. All right. I completely zoned out there. Did they say anything important? Never mind. I like this. This is just total throwaway dialogue, but it makes it into the highlight reel. Why would I do that? With that fossil out of Such a fantastic hair toss. <laughs> Those are vials of blood around his belt, by the way. Oh. I thought it was a suicide bomber. <laughs> this scene is strange. We we talked about this one a few times where we just need to wrap up Bosco and Flint and Mama Bosco's story. And so Bosco just walks in. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, he restored his body, which is downstairs, and then I don't know why he's coming. I guess he was hanging out with the robot or something. I thought it was obvious. the one who's been after me all this time. It was all just a simple misunderstanding. And then we. I mean, we still need Bosco to be in the story. We had already planned for him to be naked in the, in his, in his store for a different reason. And so we're like, hmm, how are we gonna? He was clothed, then he's back naked, and so we just said, oh, he just takes his clothes off because he likes to. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was especially hard because, so we said, okay, the correct end for his plot story here is that he's gonna go a little crazy like Norman Bates, psycho here. But then he's still gotta be in the next room, so he kind of snaps out of it at the end. Oh, party, yeah. <laughs> well, he rescued Bosco from hell. Just I think that mostly makes sense. Maybe that whole Bosco, Mama Bosco Can plant thing. Can you stuff, Satan? Well, I suppose so. I was hoping to sell it on eBay, but I've received no bids. You know, you're screaming and this was always a key part of the episode, that Satan has to be out of a job. And here. we talked about him crashing on your couch and stuff like that. Uh, but he doesn't actually fit in your office, I don't think. Uh, plus, you can't go in there. Which was a late addition we made. We said, oh, we'll block the door. That's when we went back to episode four and changed it. So the here... that you were eventually going to help Satan seemed kind of essential for me. Right, right. That, that, was, that was one of the key ideas for the whole season. we got to get Satan back in charge. So anyway, this is the scene where... Um, we basically just made a box that has two puzzle solutions for you that seemed a little bit too easy. So we said, well, at least let's throw in a red herring item. And so it was just some random thing. And then we remembered, oh, yeah, there was that bag of pork rinds that they mentioned. That would be a perfect thing to have. I don't know. I've heard some bad things. Our competitors are just afraid that if you Yeah, it seemed to be a... This part just seemed like an image that had to go in there of... Of tempting Eve with the apple, and then trying to find a way to turn that to something more restaurant-related. And I think uh, I think Brendan came up with the idea about the uh, 
kind of like that Pat Oswalt routine about the the Freedom Bowl that has all the food piled into one thing. How it's just one of the most horrible creations in existence, and the equivalent of that trying to come up with a dish that has just everything awful in it. There it is. <laughs> right, well, we had talked about, we were coming up with all these various backstories for Grandpa Stinky, and we're just, what, what is his deal? Like, how, what's his connection with Girl Stinky? Um, and we talked about this idea that he's just constantly doing research into foodstuffs and to how to toughen up the human gut and kind of force evolution to the next level. And all this stuff that perhaps will be touched upon in season three. <laughs> Didn't really come across too much in this episode. Strange about the music. That money maker. <laughs> a little strange with the music. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Yeah, that's the weird part of this whole scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think I was sold on this idea just from the take it all off and then he removes his hands. <laughs> so, okay, fine, let's put it in. <laughs> you people should be ashamed. It's a living. Costco, we freed you from your personal hell. You don't have to be naked anymore. Oh, that wasn't that even makes the highway. Like and I'm not the only <laughs> one who should be naked. <laughs> Mr. Madeline. Oh, oh man, this, <laughs> this is another one of those ones where it's just some weird outtake. It was just incorrectly put in the game where Featherly just keeps talking and talking and talking. But that ended up being, I thought, perhaps the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> I just think it's hilarious how everybody remembered Mr. Featherly being naked, and then we put him in the game, and it turns out, like the testers are saying, wait, he's not naked. <laughs> he's like, oh, he's been wearing a scarf this whole time. And, uh, yeah. Well, he had a sweater, but we had to remove it. He had a sweater and pants. <laughs> but we all assumed he was completely naked. He's not just a scarf. It's not just that he's not naked, it's he's bundled up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's, he's perhaps the most well dressed character in the game. <laughs> I mean, we did all this removing his stuff just Actually, so that we could have the I have a slight recollection of when we designed him at the beginning this one that we initially designed him without pants on. Yeah. Oh. And then I looked at him and I thought he looked too naked. <laughs> <laughs> and we needed to put pants on. Because we're a prudish art director that we <laughs> can't stand to look at a naked chicken. So this one is all Genesis related, barely. Yeah, we don't have as many Leviticus references. <laughs> well, that was the thing about Featherly wearing uh, wearing unnatural fibers. <laughs> oh, I see. Who's with me? I am. Do you mind if we perform some quick elective surgery? Whatever. I'm just the most this is another one where I, I are people bothered by the fact that they just yank his rib out? I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't bother me. <laughs> there was something I read online where they oh, <laughs> talked about how dark it was. <laughs> there's one puzzle that had an inappropriately dark solution, and I can't tell if it's this one. I know there's so many. Or any of the other <laughs> inappropriately <laughs> dark solutions. Well, the monster really takes a beating in this episode. Right, so I mean, the, the whole idea there is we often just start with any one joke and then we'll just doggedly keep trying to work it to make it work. So, okay, we need a rib to somehow bring this person to life because if we're not authentic to Genesis, then it's nothing. <laughs> I remember finding the bone saw was just a nightmare. <laughs> we just kept talking about that bone saw. And then you just got a bone saw for some reason. Don't ask me why. And then it seemed to work in with that whole... He's tempting you and Sam's personal hell with all these ways to kill peepers, but none of them works. I think I can do fine without your I think the you. monster has such a nice personality that you know that comes across. You know, it's a rich personality and it's personality of a kind of nice, mellow, sometimes depressed guy. Yeah, that just Whatever. makes you. I don't know. I feel bad that you killed him and. Cut his rib out. But he looks like he's undead. Man. He opens the top of his head and pulls his brain out. Which yes. is a lot more severe that than just cutting out a rib. That is voluntary. He does that of his own accord. That's a good point. But really, free will, is there such a thing? Wait until you've heard me play. I'm still hitting all of our devil's stereotype yeah. stories. You can do it. Play like you've never played before. 
<laughs> awesome music. Yeah. Well then, I'll just be Those are funny because we just specify in the script, he just plays a really lame song that's clearly a loser. Um, and then the sound often gets put in very, very late. So, you know, for us, we just have a camera pulling in to nothingness. <laughs> And then he says, that sucked. <laughs> but yeah, that did. Like you, and you didn't even bother to read the details of the contract? I like how we base an entire puzzle on uh, being able to uh, put a cartridge in and out of bleeps without realizing that he wasn't cartridge based. <laughs> right. Just start playing. Oftentimes when we're designing this, we don't actually know what we're talking about. We just say, oh, it's a video game machine. Just put a new video game in him. You say, oh, wait, he's not that kind of video game machine. <laughs> Chuck was very specific about blowing on the cartridge before yeah. inserting it, too. So. Well, yeah. Even though that's uh, the that's next generation. That's not the right kind of cartridge. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to admit it, Spex. <laughs> just got served like as long as it's a front-loading zero insertion force, I don't just know what that play. means, but I don't care. You will pay for this, Sam and Max. He looks like he's smiling don't now, though. Sad. What would you do with a golden fiddle anyway? When this case is over, Max and I will come Right, I think there we, we had to cut the idea that he would throw the gold fiddle down and they'd keep it. We were just running over budget. So we just quickly changed the line to say, well, you would have gotten a gold fiddle, but didn't. <laughs> Max, what's our situation? Peepers is making the move on Sybil. She's totally into it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've just gotten to the creepy line again. <laughs> this I, I've like, often heard this sequence referred to as the pinnacle of Western art. And the, <laughs> and the Duke boys sneak it in again. Yeah. So this is one where right at the end, uh, I was really hoping we could get a sexy people who looked different from that. <laughs> so you can see, oh, from Sybil's perspective, this is what it looks like. And Cam came to the rescue in a last minute Duke boys. Uh, it was extremely last minute. I know it is, but. I she and I like Bo Duke. <laughs> it's true. But not like that. <laughs> so there's again, Roger Jackson does all every deep voice, not the actual. I remember recording the, uh, the recording session for that. I was in tears in the booth from listeners to yeah, do the lines. And uh, I think everybody, I think Jared and Jory were numb to it by that point. <laughs> So this one is like a little mix of the find the true name. It's like Rumpelstiltskin crossed with Rosemary's Baby. A match made in hell. <laughs> Rosemary's Baby, another movie made in the 70s. Yes, so good nice. movie. No, I don't know if it was 70s. Was it? I think it was 60s. Uh, Who directed Rosemary's Baby? It was like the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that whole thing about uh, changing what words are, are bleeped out to just for the, the side effect of yeah, I, other random weird like things that's, bleeped out later in the game. That's the stuff I love. Hey, Dick Peacock. I think when we were trying to come up with that puzzle, Dave, you just said, it's Dick Peacock, and we just stuck with that for the rest of the <laughs> I think so, yeah. And what was the word that you wanted to be made dirty from now on? Oh, hullabaloo? Hullabaloo. <laughs> I don't think we managed to work that in there. Oh, that should be good. It's time we put an end to the charade and returned hell to its rightful owner. What Satan said! So here's where, uh, again, we started this episode. You say they just need to fall into a pit at some point. A pit full of lava. And so we said, okay, that will be what will happen right before the big climax. Jeez. <laughs> no. <laughs> Marco did some last minute effects work there. <laughs> yeah. It really helped. The burns when I pee effect was even less appropriate for much of the <laughs> production. Yeah, that, that bondage gear surprised even me. <laughs> yeah, that was another... Uh, some <laughs> the, thing, it's the kind of thing where you come into work and you're like, okay, we crossed the line. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. 
I never thought that we would actually see that. <laughs> that was something. I think I don't know who originated that idea, but I do know Jake Rodkin was a big fan of it, and he just yeah. kept saying it. I think if you say something over and over yeah, again just, enough, it just becomes it just becomes it reality. Do you mean the P part or the bondage gear? Part? The bondage, bondage gear. gear. It's like Boscow or anything else. I think we could have gone further with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's episode two, I think. Here we are returning to the Hell Pit as we learn how to fly, episode we're destined 201. to spend the remainder of our days on a tiny outcropping surrounded by an awesome right, hoping to bring the season full circle. I don't mind, Sam, as long as I'm with my best friend. Oh, Unfortunately, it ended up being quite a lot of cutscenes right in a row. <laughs> Couldn't think of anything really for you to do here. To kind of split up bits and watch scenes, but... By the ruby red goiters of Rube Goldberg. Look, Max, it's Santa's sleigh. What an unexpected stroke of luck. Where is it, Max? Remember that time long ago when we jacked Santa's sleigh in an effort to save Christmas and drove it recklessly into a hell of a... We probably should have spent a little bit more time working on the writing for this one. Since we were going to have to listen to it twice. <laughs> I remember you were, you were thinking of so I said, yeah, whatever. Let's, get this. Let's just go with this. <laughs> I was wrong. Classy as always. Now let's get out of here. Well, toward the beginning of the episode, we would have like all three of us sit in a room and go over the cutscenes line by line. Yeah, yeah. Making sure that every line worked. And yeah, that didn't last long, did it? Yeah. <laughs> Freezing Hell was another thing we really wanted to do, and yeah, kind of dovetail really nicely with the uh, the sleigh being a, yeah, a that, perfect escape vehicle. Yeah, that was always a necessary element to me. You know, it's one of those things where um, the way I imagined it kind of abstractly is, and then you'll freeze hell over, and then just, you know, all hell will break loose at that point. Um, but then when it came time to actually do that, I was just so full of promise and potential by the end of the season. It's like, I don't know, snowing and weird, weird stuff's happening. It's like I could not think of a single thing to happen. Do we have a new case, little buddy? Nah, same one, but Sybil wants me to officiate at her wedding. Well, that'll be fun. We better hurry up and restore the balance of power and hell, then. A little help here, guys. But yeah, we knew we wanted a snowball fight in hell and the idea of an ice cream truck coming. And so some of this whole idea of the recipe came working backwards from this puzzle. We said, okay, what if you have a recipe that you have to make a cake? And so that's what Grandpa Stinky's doing with Girl Stinky. And of course, you have to end with, it's somebody's birthday. Uh, I, by the way, have never seen this scene with all the three mariachis. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was another one that seemed really fortuitous during the design session. I mean, we had the bell book and candle, and where do you see candles on birthday cakes? And yeah, it all is. We've got three characters with birthday and mariachis who sing for birthdays. Everything really is connected. I can't believe I planned that way back in episode 101. I'm extremely proud of myself right now. We better run, Max. Sybil and Abe's wedding will be starting any minute. And then this this was always the end credits for the whole season was always their wedding. So they have to fall in a pit with lava and then go to Sybil and Abe's wedding. And we Everything kind of, else is incidental. At one point, we had thought about doing the wedding in uh, episode four, and then um, Brandon wanted to cruelly break them up again in episode five. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even remember that, actually. <laughs> uh, but it felt like a good way to end the season. Yeah. It was the wedding. They can go off now and have adventures somewhere else. Yeah, it's like you were saying about hell freezing over. It's just doing these these types of things where you have just lots of gags at the end of the season is just a bad idea because <laughs> at this point you're like what do you see at the wedding and you're like i don't know everybody <laughs> something there. funny they're Some all there stuff happens. they say funny things you can <laughs> just ad lib it i don't care And yeah, this is another one where we just say put as many characters as you can in the background. And Daniel, who makes the scene, he managed to get quite a lot in there. 
hundred bucks says they don't last three months. Those ocean chimps shrink to fit in that. <laughs> Did I miss something there? Uh, it's an ability you didn't know they had. Oh. When you take them out of water, that's what happens. Oh. They're the ones who are raised by you know, children whose parents didn't really love them. And what is it that you do? Listen up, because I'm only going to say this twice. I'm a bug. A bug! Nice delivery. <laughs> May I interest you in a new black man opportunity? Oh, there are a lot of voice Good actors. networking. I always love it in games when it's like you get to see all the characters from earlier yeah. in the game, especially when we have it like across episodes. Thank you so it's like, oh yeah, there's that Mohawk this. zombie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's Leonard. Oh, oh he finally got out of that closet. <laughs> For some reason, didn't remove the tape, even though his hands seemed to be perfectly functional. <laughs> We, uh, I felt so bad for Leonard as it uh, just kept going. It's like, poor Leonard. Can we please just let him out? Please? We kind of, everybody had to fight to get him let out. He was let out right at the end. Uh, yeah, that, that's one of those characteristic, um, I'm just complete insensitive jerk. Where it's just, and then he goes in your closet as a souvenir. Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, I'm busy designing the next episode now, so I forget about him. Personally. I never look in the closet again. Uh, but then the, the uh, furor over his captiveness was too much. The end. Or is it? Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun. dun. <laughs> oh. This is the scene that I wanted to be in, no matter what. You want to be in here? No, that I wanted to be in this season. <laughs> you want to be in after. We can never be defeated. We'll be back. We'll be back. <laughs> so I terrible. can't believe this is how it all ends. I mean, it's Paper's so, eyeballs. So dark. Uh. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming.